back in 2013 I was doing anti-piracy work and we were on our Klein vessel going from the Oman down to Sri Lanka and our company had a support vessel which we then left our Klein vessel and boarded our company vessel and we ceased operations, spent six days or so at sea and we needed fuel and provisions so obviously company gets in touch with the local agent in the nearest country which was India and that was all organised and on the 12th of October 2013 we were receiving fuel from the other vessel and there was a an ongoing cyclone so the the sea state was quite choppy i then went to the tactical deployment officer um i'm going to sleep and thought nothing of it and then he the tdo um awoke us pretty early on so we hadn't really had much sleep and said we've been boarded by the indian coast guard and we're being escorted at gunpoint from the the Coast Guard vessel to the port of Tutakurin. So we complied and I questioned why the ship was going so slow. Um, we were only probably an hour and a half away from land, yet it took us hours to get there. So we came into the port of Tutakurin and there was a massive welcome committee. There must have been about over 50 personnel port side there was media there was different organizations police naval you name it they came as far as Mumbai so we didn't think too much of it but we're not stupid we believed it was a seizure planned exercise and it's been executed by the Indian authorities because there's absolutely no way people are going to get in a space of a couple of hours from Mumbai to Tutukarin unless they've literally got a fast jet. There was absolutely no way. They've been aware that we're in the area and we're going to be doing this. But you you, do, you, you get told to keep out the way so you, you don't ponder anything and because... In, who, who do you think so? I believe the, the agent set us up. Why? I do not know and for those who have done mil uh, maritime there was an incident off the port off the coast of Kerala involving Indian fishermen being killed by Italian marines working for their nation doing anti-piracy operations just like the Royal Marines do for the, the UK Navy and I believe and I'm not the only one that India felt really upset that they couldn't convict these Italian Marines and they wanted someone to pay the price. Little did we know at the time it was going to be us. Disgusting as it sounds when I think back we didn't kill anyone, we didn't break any rules, we were just the wrong people in in the eyes of the Indians at the right time and we at the time you, you don't really sit and ponder what's going on because when you do say close protection or maritime and you go to these different countries around the world corruption is rife they will look at your passport and think oh it's a bit frayed it could be a, a, a dodgy passport we want payment to sign this paperwork to let you carry on with your duties so we're, we're fully under where these situations can happen but that wasn't the case with us we didn't know what was happening they didn't tell us what was happening it was just keep out the way deal with the paperwork that they were putting in front and then next minute different organizations were going well there's nothing to be had here 
we showed the weapons of uh, and the ammunition, the kit and equipment on our vessel. We had nothing to hide because we'd done nothing wrong. We were a legitimate outfit, professional uh, ex-military personnel doing a private security job. We protected Indian nationals. Why would we want to do or cause any harm to the sovereign of India, which later their media portrayed us as? And things just spiralled out of control. Different organisations, like I say, from Mumbai were saying, well, there's nothing had to, be, to be had here. And the local boys, Q Branch, their anti-terrorist CID organisation, I think probably felt a bit annoyed and looked a bit stupid. So they, in their wisdom, said, we found weapons. Well, you didn't find the weapons, you were shown them. And they're all tickety-boo, they're all legitimate. The, weapon, the six weapons that they deemed illegal out of the 35 weapons on board were in Mumbai previously one month to our arrest. So how can one minute you say these weapons are legitimate to next minute saying illegal? It's a scandal in its own right and a scandal is what it was. And it took four years of my life and other uh, work colleagues' lives as well. And it, and it absolutely destroyed our families and livelihoods. You, you did the, uh, the sentence in different stages, yeah? Like the, the initial sentence was for how long? Well, when we got initially arrested, they didn't say you are being arrested. They said you're going to hospital, which we knew. And that's when we had to make phone calls to our families. I had to make the, the phone call to my family. I, I tried ringing my sister, but with the time difference between the UK and India, I was in the early morning India. My family were asleep. UK time so I kind of rudely awoke them. My sister didn't initially answer the phone, my mum did and this is a very upsetting time for me because it's the last time I've been able to have a, f a phone conversation or a conversation with my mum before she had a double aneurysm to which it's really affected our speech. So you can understand where I feel guilt sometimes i wish i never made that phone call to me mom because the memories are lost and the only memory i've got is that phone call as stupid as it may sound to a lot of people may, pe people may think i'm being too hard on myself but you had to be there you had to be in my shoes to experience what i feel and what i've had to endure to fully know the hurt that i have to endure Times will get easier, I am fully aware of that, but it's only been so many years and the hurt is still like yesterday and the, when it happened. The memories are still raw, it is going to take a long time, but... What do you do to sort of help, you know, mentally, to help yourself mentally? Um, the, most thing I try and do is not think of it. Yes, I should go and see me, me mum more often because I should be very happy that she's still alive because anyone who knows what an aneurysm is, it's basically the brain saying I've had enough and shutting itself off. She had two. A massive blood bleed on the brain and she went into standby mode and most people don't survive so she had some fight in her she wanted to see her baby boy again and I think her fight for her life was instilled in my fight for survival 5,000 miles away from home and you know I've always been a proud man I'm you know a fighter I know that and we all go through difficult challenges in our lives and it's how you deal with it. And I, as much as I didn't want to think too much of my family, because if you think too much of your family, it does bring negativity into your life because it makes you feel 
I wouldn't say necessarily weaker, but it does bring your morale down. I'm not saying every night I didn't think of my family, and I'm not saying every night I didn't cry. I did. And I'm man enough to turn around and say that to people. But you have to remain positive. You have to see the end of the tunnel with that shining bright light. Yes, there was days where it would be dim, but it, that little glimmer of hope mm -hmm. always remained. And I think if you cling on to that and keep heading in that direction, that is probably the best coping mechanism I can ever advise anyone because it served me my time in Indian prison. You kept, you kept the uh, the bodybuilding, weightlifting and things like this, did it help you psychologically? Or? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it definitely, the gym for me and many of us around the world is a very big mental health aspect to have. It, obviously everyone isn't into the fitness, I'm fully aware of that, but for me, it keeps, it's like my church, it's like my way where, I feel like the world's not putting pressure on my shoulders. It's my time where I feel happy at most. Obviously, family happy is totally different, but it's like all my problems in the world just cease to exist when I'm in the gym. Unless I'm training legs, then yeah. I'm, I've, I, you've got to go to hell for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is, this is sort of that's like consistent since you were a young child, and because you were in the paratroopers and. Is this started from like when you were six yeah, right through? Or? I've always been fond of fitness and I was obviously in the military so I had to have a high standard level of fitness anyways but once leaving the army in 2010 I pursued more of a, a bodybuilding lifestyle. I enjoy it. Yes it can be a bit tedious and hard at times and selfish and people must think you're always eating, stop it. <laughs> but I enjoy it, it makes us feel happy and that's what, you know, we all want in life, a bit of happiness. Um, but I never let it control my life. Mm -hmm. I'm a, a very big family man. I love my family to bits. And I went to hell for my, to see my family again. And um, But the the gym really helped we in prison we ripped flagstones out the ground and found like a sharp object where we could chisel a hole through mind there was 23 of us so we, we all mucked in so you know there's, there's five other lads with you from from england yeah yeah and yeah the other lads were from North the, norway and um there was obviously six british mm. 14 estonian and three ukrainian and obviously the 12 indians they stayed at a different prison to us. Why, we do not know. I think it was because they could easily segregate them from the rest of the Indian uh, population. We got hurled with abuse, stones thrown at us, sticks thrown away. So that's us. Imagine what they would do to their own people. Mm -hmm. And I saw some grisly things happen in prison where a guy's got his throat slit and he's screaming on and no one gave a, a, a rat's ass about them. How do you think it compares to like an English, an English prison? Uh, yeah, there is some hardcore British prisons, like, you know, your Belmarsh and stuff like that, but most of the prison, yes, there is bad and probably worse criminals in that prison than, say, the prisons I was. Yeah, there was gangsters and murderers and rapists and goddamn right nasty people in India, but I think... That British prisons are too easy. They're not called prisons, they're called re-education centres. And I'm sorry, all you're doing is re-educating a criminal to commit a bigger, better crime. Not all obviously end up like that. I fully understand some people do get wrongly put in prison or like manslaughter, you know, punching someone when you're out drinking, they hit the head. You don't and they're dying, they didn't mean to kill that person, but the law's the law at the end, they've taken another person's life accidentally, so they are gonna end up going to prison for that. But the UK prison system, I think is too kind. Mm -hmm. 
it's too kind, especially from what I dealt with. Yes, okay, there would be crying, human rights abuse if I had to explain to the UK prison, right, this is what I had to endure now, replicate that in the UK prison. I don't care how big or hard you are. You'd be crying for your mammy. I was. And I'm not the hardest man in the world. How much did the, you know, like being in the paratroopers prepare you for this? Did... Being ex-military was a massive help. Mm -hmm. Mentally, physically, but most mentally more than anything because when you're in the military you 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 learn to get yourself into a routine whilst you're still mentally healthy you know like i say get a routine and uh, gear you can assess things better yeah you, you know see what you've got to your disposal if you just go in there and sob in the corner and I did that and just let that consume you you're gonna find it harder um, the military when you know you're faced with adversity or as we say the shit hits the fan you act quick you you mentally program yourself into how to deal with the situation and going into prison I acted like that as best as I could as so did everyone else as best as they could but you're not having the enemy fire rounds at you mm -hmm. you've got an organization a country against you and all they are targeting is mental and when you're in the military you can get shot and die or blown up and die Yes, there is a lot of military people suffering with PTSD and all that. And I hope they all find peace. And But when you're constantly going through mental problems, as in court cases getting cancelled and you're not seeing your family, it, it is tough. It, it, you've, you've got like a, a level where the military has you. I had to go beyond that to survive because it's just mental how, how much did your sister help with this because i've seen it online she was always at the forefront of all the me with the media uh, she traveled to india can you just talk about this and how my, she helped you yeah my sister was worth her weight in gold and she made a, a promise to not just me because i'm a brother but to everyone she will show the injustice and do her best to get it in, in not just nationally but internationally and I think she achieved that on a somewhat scale could have been bigger if we had a southerner involved but unfortunately we're all northerners and uh, one guy from Scotland so it was quite difficult I mean it got to like a debated in parliament with Theresa May and Yes. Did she help in any way? Or? Um, well, the government, the government did what they believed they could do was right. There was 50 meetings on a high political you know, level. We had two different prime ministers meet with Indian prime minister and officials. We had two foreign ministers come and visit us in prison. That doesn't happen. You only get to see your embassy staff once every three months. Mm -hmm. So yes, the government did break their own protocol because they knew there was something not right with our case. But me personally, they did let us down on a certain occasion uh, in 2014 and I will always remind them that because if they did that what they should have done it would have spared the rest of the years of pain and suffering for our families and myself however they always maintained we cannot involve ourselves in another country's legal system 
and I totally understand that. Mm -hmm. I do, I totally understand that. However, when we are innocent and you know fine well we are innocent, I believe they should have done more. But, but you, you, you talked about <coughs> in the book uh, when you came back, you said you couldn't step yeah. uh, across the uh, through the terminal. Every, every night I went to sleep, I always envisioned me coming home. And when I finally did come home in December 2017, when I was at Newcastle Airport and you've got the, the automatic doors, th this was the supposed to be the most happiest time of my life. It was practically nearly on level par with when I passed out on the square in front of my family to become a parachute regiment soldier. A very proud moment. But I couldn't do it. It felt like I was being held back. It was the most hardest step I've ever had to make just, in my life just lead up to that step just if we just go before so what happened in the end to get you you know exonerated and then your journey back into the uk and then well this moment where you were standing at that door where you just yeah back to well when you're waiting nearly one year for an appeal you you start and get a bit agitated and you yeah hounding the lawyer hounding the british government saying look things need to be done more and the captain of our vessel had bone cancer so we sent a red heron into the court to get him to go for treatment in a private uh, hospital to get his family from the ukraine to come and see him because he was he was ill he looked like basically a skeleton with flesh covering his bones he was a man down however he was getting treatment but he didn't realize it was working and his while our case is at the High Court, his case went all the way up to the top, to Supreme Court, and the highest judge of all of India heard his case. And they didn't care about his health. They just, obviously, we're getting it all put into layman terms. And he was more or less saying, why are you still in our country? Well, our lawyers and legal team jumped on this and went, well, Your Honour, if you take a little look at the High Court, you'll understand why these people are remaining in your country. And he's, he's, and he's going, right, I want a decision within two weeks. And then when we got given that news, it felt like a, a bit of the world had just lifted off our shore. It was on like Donkey Kong. Two weeks, here we go. It was one week and we got the date, the 27th of November, 2017. We called it Judgment Day. Mm -hmm. The night before, and I know I've said this many times, it sounds cheesy as hell. However, it's a song which I've always liked anyways, but it means a, a bit of a, a bit more special. And it was playing rock ballads on the radio the only English radio station in Chennai, Chennai FM. And it played the final countdown song by Europe. And I stood up in the cell and I went, that's it, it's over tomorrow. And you get a few guys being a bit apprehensive and I totally understand that. They were like, oh, well, we'll see what happens, don't get too excited. I was like, you just heard it. He, the judge has said, I want a decision. So if they don't give a decision, it's going up there anyways. So it's, You've got, to be, you've got to remain positive and hopeful, but realis realistic. And I was all that. Obviously, a lot of people mustn't have thought I was too realistic, and it is what it is. Um, so, the next day, you could understand how people's heads were like itching to know when we're going to find out any information. And it was around tea time, maybe. The hours between four and five. I was outside training in my little Flintstone gym and get given the information. One of the guys, Paul, came to the barred window and he went, Dunny, Dunny, Dunny. I went, what's the matter, Gans? Case acquitted. And you know when someone's so excited but 
that, that happy but they want to cry at the same time with happiness that's how his voice came across and I was just like see I told you and then it, it hit me uh, my head was Didn't going you, all you over your work out, no? I couldn't finish my work out no <laughs> I couldn't I had to go in and it was just whew, wow and then so no one slept Sunday night no one slept Monday night so we're running on fumes after two days which it affects you a lot more because you're not getting the correct nutri nutrition so we are feeling proper lethargic etc um, and then the next day as soon as the uh, prison guards opened the cell door I've only pushed them out the way and said I need to go and train and tire myself out and as I was trained, I would walk around the compound and then I saw one of the guys getting summoned to the superintendent. And I said, uh, what's the crack? He goes, oh, I've been summoned. So I caught him on the way back. And it just, to hear what he said to me feels like yesterday. It, it feels like winning the lottery. That the 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 feeling I felt being told that is probably how I will feel if I if I won the lottery. I went, what's the crack? He went, pack your bags. The embassy's coming at eleven o'clock. That them words to me is like Nick, you've won the lottery. Okay. Freedom. You can't put a price on freedom. And I know what freedom really means because I had it stripped and taken away from me for four years. And it's something I value very much in my life now. And it, it felt like someone just kneecapped us, but in a good way, if you can ever envision that. It's hard, I know, but that's how it felt like because my knees buckled mm -hmm. and I felt ill. I was like, is he just chitting me here? And I went in, I went, are you telling the truth? He went, yeah. The embassy's coming. Get your stuff now. And I was like, F and I, I've never seen a bunch of people with like headless chickens in my entire life. Happiness, finally. Uh, and obviously we went to the hotel, no sleep. You think, well, how can you not sleep in a like, nice, plush, nice, lovely bed? I'm thinking, try sleeping on a thin mattress for nearly two years. Mm -hmm. Sleeping in a normal, normal bed, it's like alien to me. I couldn't get comfortable. So I, I didn't sleep for nearly a week. And I came home and I, and we all kind of was politely told to get out of the country by the Indian authorities. Because I chose a different plane uh, ride home. So I would only spend two hours in Dubai. But the embassy said to me, you've got to go tonight. I was like, oh man, I've got to spend about six hours in Dubai to then do a seven hour flight. I was like, I was hanging out. Absolutely, I was exhausted. Not slept in nearly a, a week. And I'm having to inject caffeine into my eyeballs to keep us awake because I was like, do not miss your flight and fall asleep in Dubai. And I don't know, anyone who's been to Dubai, you know you can get a Wi-Fi signal anywhere. I couldn't get a signal for love and money. It was like, it was like, it was like my family said, do not let Nick get a signal. <laughs> do not, and you know, it was mad because I had inboxes from so many lovely people and I finally got through all of them in February. So I'm coming home in December. <laughs> I got finished them in February. And there was people who I knew served with in the army saying, send us your flight details I'll, I'll upgrade you to first class but so I'm in Dubai and I'm waiting can't get an internet signal I was on my own because the other guys had different gates to go to and their flight was before mine so I'm sat there going <sighs> I've got no money we barely I was I was kind of saying I was begging them can you just you know, give us a coffee for nothing. <laughs> I was literally on the bones in my arse. I had no signal, so I couldn't like get a message to my sister, can you put us a tenner in, whatever tenner is in dirhams? And uh, probably not a lot. Um, I was just hanging out, man. I was nearly not slept for a week, and I got on the plane, and I had 
five star treatment cattle class by Emirates and I thank Emirates from the bottom of my heart they allocated a trolley dolly for me she wouldn't serve anyone else bar me and when I got on the plane to fly to Newcastle from Dubai um, the, there was a, a few people who recognised us and they, gave, the, the, they showed utmost respect they didn't come and hound us or anything or ask but when I you know when you clock someone's eyes they kind of just mouthed well done welcome home and it was such a, a nice thing and I can't sleep on planes very rarely I normally just get mortal and pass the time away and uh have to explain what a mortal is to non well if you don't know what if you're a non-UK resident and you don't know what mortal means it means excessively alcohol intoxication <laughs> but I couldn't I wasn't going to rock up mortal in front of me family and media <laughs> where you uh, four years worth of alcohol just supped in seven hours no I couldn't do that I, so I tried watching a few films and every dream I had was always different but the one thing that was always the same was you know when the cap you're about to come into your airspace and the captain says we are now entering UK airspace can you go back to your seats and buckle up kind of thing I was literally about to pass out and when he said that over the, the speakers it like someone had just taken me dead battery out and put a fresh one in I've never felt so fresh in my entire life it was like I've just been recharged mm -hmm. after nearly a week of running my battery down and getting off that plane I was it's been four years so I've not been in an airport I haven't got a clue what's going on and I was the last person to get off the flight the captain came out, shook my hand, says welcome home and all the, the girls um, were saying welcome home as well and I didn't get their numbers unfortunately <laughs> I had a girlfriend at the time so that's my reason um, and I walked down the steps but before I did that after the initial shock of December air nearly going through my body and killing us I took the most biggest breath of fresh air and, and I think my nostrils had a fit because I'm not being nasty but India's not the most uh, fragrance <laughs> yeah it's not the most fragrant of countries and that's not being nasty unfortunately that's the truth and to smell crisp December clean British air was like heaven for my nostrils and then I was walking down the steps and the, the baggage guys the airport staff were there clapping their hands saying welcome home and I've, I've, only, I've only tripped up because I was get, trying to get it you know stop myself from being emotional and then the bus was waiting there with everyone on the plane they were probably thinking I've got to get home here you absolute bell end hurry up <laughs> so I got on the plane I was kind of sorry and then uh, we got to the airport and one of the airport staff picked us up and it was a tr like I say, I thank you Newcastle Airport for what you did that day. It was uh, absolutely tremendous for me and my family. And I bypassed all of security, which I was gutted because I could have brought loads of tabs back. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't have time. <laughs> cigarettes. <but> yeah, <laughs> cigarettes. If you don't know what a tab means, um, and where the carousel was, my bag was there on its own you'd the you'd have thought the baggage handler literally just jumped on the plane went right where's nick dunn's bag found it then can wait absolutely tremendous by newcastle air uh, airport thank you so much for doing that and then obviously i bypassed all the security and uh the the airport lady said to us this is the path i can't go it's you and it was the most daunting frightening experience but happy at the same time weird emotional feeling up and I got to these doors and I couldn't I couldn't I was frozen I've been waiting for this moment for four long years and I can't even walk through 
doors. Uh, it was, and I, every time I was building myself up to take that step, I couldn't. And then some guy just sideswiped the side of us and then opened the doors. I saw all the media down the right side. I saw friends and family down the left. And then the shut, and I was like, I was only having a panic attack, and I was like, oh, shit, what's going on? <laughs> and then I was, I tried again, and I couldn't, and another person opened the doors, and my dad was talking to my sister, and my dad clocked us, and he went, he's there, he's there, and if you've ever seen the video, and it doesn't really explain it, but the feeling of when you see me come through them doors to my sister greeting us, it was like two magnets. Like, she was only a dinky girl and I gave her the biggest hug ever because of what she'd done in them four years. She deserved it more than most. And it was unbelievable. 